The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It is Thursday, and we are in like the end of April now, I guess, technically, no longer even the mid of April, but it is Autism Awareness Month here in the United States. For a lot of people, they're calling it Autism Action Month. I think both are appropriate. We need awareness and we need action. And of course, here we've asked everyone to participate in our campaign for compassion in action, asking everyone to do something nice for someone else. And it can have to do with autism or it can have something to do with any one of a million other things, but just doing something nice for someone else, especially with all the things going on in the world this week, it seems very appropriate that if, and, and I was listening to on the radio on the way coming in this morning to some of the, uh, the telecast of the uh, services being held for the victims who passed away in the bombing of the Boston Marathon on Monday. And uh, one of the speakers, one of the clergy was saying, you know, the only way to fight evil is overwhelming, have overwhelming good. And so I want to encourage all of you to take the opportunity to do something nice for someone else. I've seen in my own life how it, much it really changes. I, last Monday, a week ago Monday, shaved my head here on the show to show support for a young dad with cancer, Ryan Oaf. You can find his Facebook page, Fighting for Ryan and I it was such a small thing to do and and yet uh, you know they say about karma what you put out comes back times two and we've had uh, experience in our family in the last week so many people being kind and compassionate with us and so I encourage you I felt better all week long for having done something it's been a very infectious thing and we're looking at doing different things and people have called and said uh, what what can we do and we've been giving ideas here on the show and we'll continue to give them but most especially we want to hear from you guys so let us know what are you doing to put compassion in action there is nothing that's too small somebody said oh I, you know I don't even want to tell you because it seems like such a small thing and when they told me it was a huge thing um, that they were helping a family who has lost their job and are on the verge of being homeless. That's not a small thing. That's a huge thing. So we encourage you to tell your stories. We'd be happy to have you here on the show. We'd be happy to feature a video if you want to send us a one to two minute long video telling who you are what you've been doing for Compassion Action. We'd love to show it here on the show. Emily's going to cycle through some of the different ways that you can get a hold of us here because this whole show is meant to be interactive. We talk about autism from a 360-degree perspective. I do want to remind you that the only way to watch us live is to go to www.autism-live.com. When you go there, you see uh, a desktop. There is a box normally that says uh, <laughs> the questions we're answering right now. You can usually type there and uh, hit enter, and it shows up magically on the screen. There has been a problem while they're updating this uh, something with the server. I don't understand the computer ease. The people in IT tell me that it will be fixed shortly, possibly during the show. I hope so. If it does, I, I will see new messages from you guys. So keep trying. Don't give up on us. We will get that feature up and running. You know how maintenance is. Uh, it's not gremlins in this case. It's maintenance. So it is being worked on. In any case, there are lots of other ways to get a hold of us. Emily just cycled through some of them for you. Yes, there's the gremlins. <laughs> I love our little gremlins. Um, and we encourage you to reach out to us. If you email us, we, we I will tell you we're a little bit backed up, but I have a list of messages from you guys that we're we're getting to, some very important messages, and I appreciate your patience with that. We are a small staff. We call ourselves the little show that could. <laughs> 
<laughs> because we can, right? I always say here, si se puede, we can do this. Yes, we can. Um, <clears throat> but it does take, take some time, but the good news is it's all free. We're here to support you in your journey through autism, whatever it is. If you're a parent, teacher, a practitioner, working with an individual who is on the spectrum, or if you yourself are on the spectrum, we're here to support you and help you to find the answers, the information, the funding, the support, whatever it is that you're seeking. And of course, sometimes our answers, unfortunately, are that doesn't exist yet. But you know what I hear from you guys overwhelmingly is that when you identify a need and heaven knows there is a great deal of need when you identify a need then you guys are stepping up uh, like a wonderful army and filling that need in we're talking to more and more parents and more and more individuals on the spectrum who are starting to support our community by providing services so uh, we'll look forward to doing that in fact I want to I want to give a little heads up that we're declaring May we, you know this is autism awareness month right now but we're declaring May here on Autism Live uh, the Autism Entrepreneur Month. So if you are an individual who has started a business or you have a product that has to do with autism, we want to feature you on the show in May. So if there's something, if you've written a book, if you have some sort of product, I saw this great great thing online yesterday. I'm trying to hunt down who is the inventor of it. It's uh, a shoelace thing that has a, a locking elastic shoelace. So no more tying shoelaces because I got to be honest with you. We taught my son how to tie his shoes and that you know, was really difficult. <laughs> Can I say that? It was really difficult. And it was so difficult that I wanted to take a little vacation from it once he learned how to tie his shoes. And so, you know, because the elevator does not go all the way to the top with or without my hair, I, the next two years, I bought shoes that were all Velcro. So when it was, then when I, when he tried on a pair of shoes that he really liked that were ties, suddenly we realized that he didn't remember how to do it. So we had to cycle back through the whole thing. And he he can once again tie his shoes, but sometimes in the morning it's more than I want to deal with, right? Uh, and now that he knows how to do it, I'm never going to leave it completely alone, but I love this locking shoelace thing uh, because the truth of the matter is that, you know, he's not going to make a living tying his shoes. I just want him to be able to do it, but that doesn't mean that he necessarily has to be the king of it uh, or even do it every day. Uh, so if you've got an invention like that, something that makes it easier for an autism parent, makes it easier for a person who has autism, Autism. If you've got a service that you're providing, we want to showcase you on the show in May. So putting that out there. And if you know somebody that has, they've uh, started a product that you really, really love, let us know because we want to feature them here in May. Very exciting month. Uh, all right. So I uh, also want to remind you that I host this show, but I am not an expert in autism and I'm not an expert in psychology. I'm not an expert in ABA. I'm not an expert in nutrition or uh, legal issues, but I am a mom. I'm a mom who had a son diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. That was a little over seven years ago. And he we had the benefit of the best help and support and services that could be found. And we were able to do it without having money in the bank to be able to do that. And it is because of that, that I'm here to pay it forward. So I host the show and I want to hook you guys up with answers. I feel very passionately about it, but please know that I am not an expert. We bring experts in. We're going to have experts a little bit later on in the program, um, but I am not one of them. Uh, I always like to say that I consider myself an expert in my child, but he would prove me wrong this afternoon. <laughs> So just when I think I've got uh, a beat on what to do with him, he, I don't know, grows and progresses and then I have to run to catch up. That's a quality problem, one that I hope that you all share, uh, if not now, somewhere down the road. But in any case, uh, we like to start every morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, and try to make sense of it for those of us who either have autism or have a child on the autism spectrum. Because 
it's a jargon intensive world. Now we know that for the professionals, they get indoctrinated to the jargon very early and then they don't have a problem with it. The rest of us, you know, we're running to catch up exactly because we, you know, on the first day of autism, you don't say, oh, I'm going to sit down and crack the book open and figure out all the possible terms that someone is going to use in conjunction with myself or my child. Let's face it. It's like number 338 on a very long list of things to do. But it is on the list of things to do because it does make a difference in how we get that help and support and how we understand it. And if we can use our time efficiently and effectively. And I always talk on this show about how important it is to do that. We want to be efficient and we want to be effective. So knowing what the jargon is, helpful on that journey. Today's term is a particularly difficult one. It's mastery. Now, this is one of those terms that we've heard before, right? So we, it comes with preconceived notions of what it might mean. But when we're talking about autism, it's a very specific thing. So let's take a look at our actual definition. Mastery, the point at which the child or individual is said to have successfully acquired the targeted, be, targeted behavior determined by a previously established criteria. Huh? Okay, let's look at our actual definition. When the child is independently demonstrating the desired skill level, desired skill at the desired level. Okay. But here's what's important about mastery. You know, the expression, the tail wagging the dog. We want to be really careful when we're talking about mastery, that we're not letting the tail wag the dog, that we're not saying that the criteria of the mastery determines whether the child mastered it. When we go to teach a skill to anyone, and I'm, I'm saying a child here, but the truth is it's for us as well. If I wanted to learn, um, I've been, I, I admit it, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I'm, I've been watching a little bit of that show Splash and they have the celebrities diving off. I, I know, I know what, what is wrong with me that I'm watching that, but there is a certain amount of, it's interesting in that these are people who are overcoming their fears to be able to do this. And I don't watch everybody, but, um, and here are these people who want to learn a skill that they've never done before and they're adults, right? And they're neurotypical adults. All right. Maybe Louis Anderson, we're not a hundred percent sure, but, um, okay. So they're, they're learning these skills. I digress. Right. Um, and they, we want to be able to judge whether they've actually learned the skills. So before when we know if you, if you have done any research on teaching, we know that one of the most effective ways to teach something is to decide beforehand what it is you're going to teach and what, what you will determine success to be. So if you're going to teach somebody how to dive and you say, well, we want them to be able to do it three out of five times because it's very rare that mastery can be a hundred percent. Right. But we say, okay, if three out of five times they can do it, then we're going to consider that they have have this thing done. All right. But if we were going to teach a child how to cross the street, we wouldn't pick that criteria. We would say the child needs to do it a hundred percent of the time in order for it to be considered mastery. Um, I like to talk about the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm totally capable of using a key and a lock. Uh, I'm an independent uh, adult with a master's degree and I can use a key and a lock. It's maybe not my best skill, I'll be honest with you. And I don't get it right every time, right? And I would never set the mastery for me in my life to get it every time because I can try it again. If I don't get the key and the lock the first time, I can do it again. But I want to be able to do it three out of five times because otherwise I'm not going to be able to, I'm going to be standing outside my office, my home, my car and not being able to get the key in, right? So we set a criteria. We say for this particular skill, mastery is going to be that they do it three out of five times or four out of five times or five out of five times, depending on the skill. We set that in motion and we're going to include some other stuff in it too. And we're going to say, and not only that, they need to be able to do it three out of five times, but across a certain number of days. Um, you know, that if I am able to turn the key in the lock and, uh, I'm able to do that great. But if five times in a row, I miss five times out of a hundred times, but it's five times in a row, we might say, Ooh, we need to work on this a little bit. It's time to back up and say, mm, let's take another stab at this. So again, keeping in mind that you set the criteria before you go to teach it, but then you teach it and you let how the child is being taught the skill inform you about is the mastery criteria something that makes sense.
So we're never, I can think of a couple of different circumstances where we set mastery criteria for a skill that my son was going to do and said, all right, he has to be able to do it across, uh, three out of five times across three sessions with different people in different settings. Okay, that's a pretty run-of-the-mill mastery criteria. Means that if they're asking him, what's your name, that he's gonna say, Jem, and he's gonna say it most of the time without having to be prompted, and he's gonna be able to do it with mom, he's gonna be able to do it with dad, he's gonna be able to do it on Tuesday when we're home at the dining room table, he's gonna be able to do it Wednesday at the grocery store when the grocery store clerk asks him. Him, right? That seems like a pretty fra fair criteria. But sometimes we get down to it and the child is able to do the skill and we see that they really, you know, it's that mental thing where you go, you know, I really think he has it. By George, I think he's got it. Um, but maybe our criteria doesn't match the fact that we're looking at it and going, yeah, he really does have it. And that happened several times with my child. But fortunately, I was working with a really good supervisor who said, you know what, he, that we're going to change the mastery criteria because he does have it. And this mastery criteria makes more sense. So that's what I mean about don't let the tail wag the dog. If your child, if you look at it and go, no, she's got it. I know she's got it. Um, she has this mastered, but the criteria doesn't match her ability. Um, but you want it there as a guideline. If we go in and say, well, we're just going to teach it and we don't know what we consider mastery, you're not going to be as efficient and as effective. But always looking at it afterwards saying, does this mastery criteria make sense with what the child is doing right now? Very, very important. Why are we talking about this today? Because we, it's going to make sense. Uh, we always have a question of the day for you. Our question of the day today is what safety issues are you working on right now? Right now. You notice that I mentioned that with safety issues, our mastery criteria is going to be different, right? It's more likely that we're going to be at 100% because I, I don't know about you, but for me as a parent, if my child is safe only 70% of the time crossing the street, that's not good enough. He's got to be safe 100% of the time uh, in 100% of situations over a long period of time. I'm never going to say, well, if he can do it twice, then I'm just going to let him cross the street whenever he feels like he can do it. Um, right? My, my mastery criteria is going to be really different for that. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we're, we're talking about mastery today. So what safety issues are you working on right now? And of course... You know, I don't know about you, but in my home, there were different conversations that were had this week about how to be safe in different circumstances, especially in light of the Boston Marathon and the fact that, you know, the stories that have come in about the child who was eight years old and who was killed, um, that he was standing there with his mom and his dad and he went from his mom from his dad to his mom and, and the explosion happened and what to do in those circumstances and how important it is to listen to other people, how important it is to, um, do what you're asked to do in those circumstances and to recognize who are the people who are in authority. And so we've been having all of those conversations this week in my house and about, you know, if a fireman asks you to do something that, that's going to supersede a lot of things going on that, you know, you may have been told never, ever to leave mom or dad. But if a fireman says you need to go over there and stand, then, you know, um, you know, how to judge and gauge for all those circumstances about how to behave and, and when to behave. So that's what we're working on right now. But I want to know from you guys, and we'll take a second a little bit later on to check in on Facebook to see what you guys are working on. Um, but really important that we decide and that we constantly be working on safety issues because as our kids get older, the safety issues don't go away. They just change. They morph new, new things about, you know, do you do what your friends ask you to do? Who do you listen to? When do you listen to them? So there are always safety issues to be worked on. Okay, we always have a topic for the week, and clearly, I've already given it away at this point, our topic for this entire week is safety. Keeping our kids safe, um, keeping our families safe, teaching our kids skills that they can generalize, because we can't possibly teach every single scenario. I don't know any parent before this week that was having a conversation with their child saying, if we're standing at the finishing line of a race 
and we hear a loud noise, this is what we'll do, right? We can't possibly think of all the different circumstances in which our children may be faced within their lifetimes. So it's important to teach them safety skills and to teach them in a variety of different circumstances to allow them to generalize. If we're doing fire drills and we should be doing regular fire drills, um, and I, even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, ah, we haven't done a fire drill or an earthquake drill in a long time. Really important that we do them on a regular basis and that we do them at different times of the year. We do them at different times of the day or the night. We do them for, starting from different rooms and different scenarios. Scenarios. So um, we are going to talk about safety more today and uh, again tomorrow. Really important for our well-being, for our kids' well-being. And I know we sleep better when we feel like our kids are prepared for safety issues. Some of the different things that we have going on today, we have a very special guest that's going to be joining us in just a little while, Carrie Magro. And we've had Carrie on the show before. He is an amazing young man who is on the spectrum and he is a speaker. He is getting his graduate degree and is one of those people that you know, he's already changed the world, but he'll continue to change the world. So very exciting that we'll have an opportunity to talk with Carrie. A little bit later in the program, we're going to be joined by Ashley Colas. She does good stuff with us, uh, introducing products and ideas that are helpful to us, if, especially if you have children on the spectrum, um, things that are useful. Gotta love that. And a little bit later, we did a blog this week uh, about three safety tips that everyone should know. And we're going to go over some of the different things that we featured in the blog, but of course you can check out the blog on our website if you go to www.autism-live.com. At the top there is now a blog tab. Uh, it's one of our newer additions to the website. So all of that and much more, I believe we also have a myth of the day for you as well today. So much more. And in just a moment we're going to come back and it was over a week ago that somebody had written in and said we were talking about diet and um, it was during Ask Dr. Dor and somebody said, would you please give us a rundown of what Jem eats? Give us examples of what he eats in the morning, lunch, and dinner. Because um, we were talking about the fact that he's on a very specialized diet that has changed over the years. And I said, I promise I will do that. And we haven't had a moment to do that. So we're going to take a break, come back, and I'm going to tell you what Jem eats. That's my son. And then we'll be joined by Carrie Magro. So stick with us. Currently in the United States, one in 88 children is affected by autism. One in 88 means something different when your child is the one. Recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, host of Autism Live, an online show about autism broadcast by CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm also the mother of a child with autism. My beautiful son, Jem. You know our old joke, guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. So we're gonna take the chickens. But things weren't always so easy. I remember when Jem was first diagnosed with autism. I used to lay awake at night in bed and pray for someone or something that could help us to get our child back. My prayers were answered by Dr. Doreen Grampichet and the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. CARD treats autism and other related disorders using the principles of ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. It is also recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Surgeon General. About a year after we started treatment with CARD, we were able to see tremendous improvement and we got our child back. What grade are you in? Second. You are a smart cookie, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you like school? Uh, yeah. Do you have any good friends? Yeah, Oscar. Oscar is your best friend? Yeah. And my child is just one of thousands to benefit from CARD ABA therapy. Across the nation and around the world, children are making amazing progress and being given the keys to unlock their full potential. We are extremely grateful for the amazing job CARD has done in helping our daughter. Our daughter today, just in four months, I think is a totally different child than when she started with CARD. I kind of see it as, it, it seems like her brain in a way was asleep and now that we've gotten so many services, um, 
We've seen her wake up. Did you have some gases? <laughs> Recovery is possible if you take the right steps, um, if you're willing to put in all the hard work. And seven and a half years, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth every little bit, and um, Card's been there with us every step of the way. I have two children with autism. I can't imagine a day without Card or the therapist. Um, they've been so instrumental in helping us with our kids and, and shaping their lives and helping us help them. Thank you, Christy and Big Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie and Mariana. We've tried other things before ABA, but the most beneficial thing has been ABA services, and I'd be the first person to tell any newly diagnosed family that you have to, you have to contact an ABA provider. And if you're lucky enough to have a card, you're very blessed. Recovery from autism is absolutely a possibility. We've been recovering children for over 20 years. It's just a matter of identifying the child's medical needs, understanding the child's sensory issues, and then teaching the child all of the skills they need in order to function normally. We know there's hope for autism. Autism is treatable and recovery from autism is possible. Welcome back to Autism Live. We had a question that came in a week ago from a viewer who wanted, we were talking about diet with Dr. Doreen Grandpache, and one of you wanted to know, what does my son eat? Because I have said before on the show that my son has been on a very specific diet that has changed a thousand times, right? Because just like mastery, you know, you got to see, is this, is this working? What do we want to do? And um, my son, shortly after he was diagnosed with autism, I was talking to an OT who was evaluating him and said, isn't there any, she was saying, you know, it's going to take several months before you can start services. And I said, isn't there anything, anything that we can be doing in the meantime? And she said, well, you know, there is that gluten-free diet. I don't, you know, I don't really think that it works, but a lot of parents say that it works, but doctors say that it doesn't work, but there is that. And I said, gluten, what is gluten? I had no idea. Now I'm a person who's allergic to wheat. If she had said wheat-free, I would have known what we were talking about, but she didn't. She used the term gluten and I had no concept uh, because I'm allergic to wheat. I wasn't, and when they had the whole bread maker phase, I was not doing that. <laughs> so I had no idea. And she said, oh, it's, it's wheat. It's something in wheat. Now this, of course, in me, because I'm allergic to wheat, I went, oh, I can do this. I've been doing this for years. This is no problem. Uh, but of course I had a child who was living on chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese like so many people out there. Um, so it was a, I had to get a little creative, but that part of it was easy. It wasn't until we saw progress on the gluten-free diet and I typed in to my uh, computer on Google, I put in gluten-free diet autism and it came up gluten-free casein-free. And I said, okay, now what is casein? Oh, it's a protein in milk. So then we're a week into this, we also took out the milk, which was for my family, harder um, because I wasn't entirely sure how to do that. But we were gluten-free, casein-free for a while and tremendous progress that my child made. And this is before we started ABA and I could see that it was really setting us up for success with ABA. Then we uh, saw that the progress stopped. He was adding words just and talking more, but the progress just stopped. We didn't see a regression, but there was no further progress. And that was, and I saw that most of what his diet was at that point was potato based. The child, you know, how it was a potato chip, a French fry, a baked potato, you know, potato soup, whatever it was, he wanted a potato. And I read about the specific carbohydrate diet and said, okay, I think this is our next phase. We went on the specific carbohydrate diet for less than 30 days because right around 30 days, he went into ketosis. We were really being monitored by a doctor and I encourage people to be monitored by a doctor. These are not things to go willy nilly. You want to make sure that your child is nutritionally appropriate within, you know, appropriate guidelines. A lot of times when you go on these diets, there is the great possibility that your child will eat healthier, but if you aren't doing it properly, they won't get as much nutrition as they were when they were having the chicken nuggets, which isn't that frightening. So, um, and believe me, I have nothing against chicken nuggets. We make chicken nuggets at home now with a good recipe. We featured one here on the show, but using really good ingredients, right? Uh, that's the key to chicken nuggets. So, uh, 
Then we went on a modified specific carbohydrate diet, and we also went on a modified fine gold diet. And you can Google all of these terms to find out more about them. We, of course, encourage you to look at uh, Julie Matthews' website, Nourishing Hope. We've had Julie on the show twice now. Amazing, amazing expert in terms of these kinds of issues. So... Uh, Anyway, my son's diet has changed a lot. When we were on the modified fine gold, we took out anything that was high in salicylates. So there were no grapes, no raisins, no apples, no tomatoes. I'm trying to think what else was removed from his diet. It really got very complicated then. We have cycled all of those things back into his diet at this point. He, we really limit... He, there is no sugar in his diet. There are no artificial colors, and I am absolutely immovable on the artificial colors and artificial flavors. If sugar is an ingredient in something now that it's like sixth or seventh down the list, and, and it makes sense, like if it's a waffle and the first ingredients are like brown rice, and you get down to that there's the same amount because, you know, they list them by the amount that's in there. So if the salt and the sugar are close to each other, you know, I might fudge that a little bit. But otherwise, there is no sugar in his diet. There have not been any eggs for a long time, but we've started including them very slowly back into baked goods because research has shown that if a child is allergic to eggs, but they can tolerate them in baked goods that eventually they can get eggs back into their diet. So we're doing that very, very slowly. There is, uh, for a lot of years, there was absolutely no yeast. And now we're allowing a little bit of inactive yeast in his diet. So here's the rundown of currently right now. And after Julie was on the show, I changed some things because we were not including a protein in his breakfast. And I realized, oh, that's bad. Why aren't we doing that? We need to do that. Uh, so currently in the morning, he will usually have something in the neighborhood of toast that is brown rice, yeast-free toast. We get food for life toast. And uh, with food for life bread, it comes frozen. And then we heat it up and either toast it or uh, sometimes it depends. Uh, we make like a French toast thing, but without the egg. And so he'll have that. I have just started allowing him to, after years, to have a little bit of soy. So now we will give him a little bit of soy margarine that's on that. And he will have either breakfast sausages, and we like to get Applegate, or Shelton's makes a turkey sausage patty. Um, that's a very good thing. You have to cook it at least 20 minutes. Um, or there is a maple bacon by Applegate as well that does not have the sugar in it, but has uh, maple syrup in it. And I'm allowing a very little bit of that. So those are the protein things that we're doing. And I also just recently got some very good, I got them at Costco. They're veggie burgers that are just made with, they're vegan and gluten-free. So there's no dairy. There's no gluten in them. It's mostly vegetables with a little bit of brown rice, and he likes those as well. So that's a potential, and it's high in protein because a lot of times you get you see these uh, substitutes, and, and they're not high in protein. So there's that. Um, sometimes for a treat, we do Vans waffles. We get the natural one. It's called Naturally... I'm trying to think what it is, but it's gluten-free, and it doesn't have sugar in it. Um... And that's by Vans, waffles, naturally something. I don't, I can't think what it is, but they have lots of different flavors. It's the naturally one. I don't naturally something. Okay. Um, and then other times for an extra special treat, he gets something called pizza toast. So we'll take the, the toast and put a little bit of spaghetti sauce on it. Maybe put a piece of Applegate salami on it, turkey salami. Um, and then he gets some Daya cheese on top of that, all toasted. That's an extra special treat, not not to be given when he's already dressed for school because it's very messy. Uh, and, they, and he looks like he's been hit by a pizza truck after he eats that because it is it is it's very, very messy. Uh, but it reminds me of my mother used to make us English muffin pizzas sometimes for a special treat. And that, so that's a very fun thing. Now for lunch, um, 
and and first of all, he has a snack in the morning, and the things that go in the snap snack bag are things like Lundberg brown rice cakes. Um, we get the organic ones because uh, you have to be very careful about where your brown rice source is from. Lundberg is very good. He will do a gluten free and marked specifically gluten free. Um, Hummus, absolutely loves that, and it comes in different flavors. You can get a lemon one, a garlic one, a spinach one, a red pepper one. If you're doing red peppers, really important to make sure that it's an organic one because the red peppers can be very high in pesticides. Um, so he sometimes he'll get that on a on a rice cake with some cherry tomatoes and some um, of the Armenian cucumbers that don't have seeds in them um, that are very uh, small and tender and you eat the peels as well with them. So he'll do that. Sometimes he likes to have the, um, the rice, not, not, not rice, uh, the seaweed snacks that they make. We try to limit those cause they can be high in sodium, but that's an extra special treat. Other times we take peppers and we get the organic ones and chop them up into the strips so that, you know, he might get a bag of yellow and red peppers or green and yellow or orange and red, whatever it is, whatever is available and is organic at this time of year. So those are other things that go into the snack pack. Usually there's water. Sometimes there's a, sometimes there's a coconut water that has just a little bit of flavor in it. Um, Hanson's has started making a coconut water that's very good for hydration when they're at school and it goes in a juice box. So it looks like what all the other kids have, um, but very refreshing uh, for electrolytes and low in calories. It doesn't have any sugar in it, a very, very good thing. And that comes in three different flavors as well. So that's sort of snack. Then for lunch, it's usually whatever vegetables we didn't put into the snack bag. So it might be the, the cucumbers and the tomatoes in the snack bag and the peppers um, in the lunch bag. Sometimes a cutie um, for a fruit that's a very, very small orange, like a mandarin orange. So it's just the, just the very smallest amount of sugar, but it's got just a little bit of kick to it. Hit for his protein for lunch, he usually, there are sausages that we get at a local farmer's market that it's a, a, a family owned company that does things very cleanly and they're, um, chicken sausages that come fully cooked and have different flavors so that we can vary it so that he's not eating the same thing all the time. And I just heat them up on the weekend and bag them in separate. I put, we get these wax paper bags uh, that are fabulous instead of the Ziploc bags. But if you use Ziplocs, make sure that you use a company like Ziploc or somebody that says right on the box, they're BPA free, and then never heat anything up in a Ziploc bag. Those wax paper bags are perfect for heating things up. Um, um, for when you're home or going someplace. So he usually gets a sausage um, and then he gets some more vegetables uh, with his lunch. A, a splurge in, for lunch would be a little bit of potato chips. You can get, there are companies such as Lay's that they're gluten free if you make sure you don't get the really crazy flavored ones. Um, so that would be a big treat for lunch. So it's those kinds of things. Sometimes now that we're doing the maple bacon, yesterday he had a BLT. He had a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich and was just thrilled uh, that he could be sitting there having his sandwich and we've started sending those veggie patties as well. Today he's got a veggie patty that's going and today he also has some chicken. We um, did some grilled chicken the other day and so he's taking some chicken with him to school. I'm trying to think what else is in the bag today. Uh, so that's lunch. Now for dinner, um, for his proteins, there's a wide variety. Uh, there are gluten-free, nit nitrate-free hot dogs, which make it really easy for me at dinner time. I love to do the mac and no cheese that we have featured here on the show, and that recipe is on our website that Lisa Ackerman did. Um, so hot dogs and macaroni and cheese, and always a vegetable, right? Jem knows, because it has been drilled into him, it's still amazing to me that he knows that on his plate, that it's really going to be separated into like a three compartment thing for dinner, that there is going to be some sort of, sort of carb, there's going to be some sort of protein, and there's going to be some sort of vegetable. And if dad tries to sneak in a meal with one of those things missing, he, Jem will say, uh, you know, where, 
where is my carbohydrate? I need a carb on this plate or, or where is my vegetable? Um, sometimes he gets a salad and there's a really good salad dressing that he loves that it's the Tuscan dried tomato and it's called, they're, they're, they're the gluten free. I'm, oh, it's going to be terrible that I can't remember this. Um, but there's a whole line of, they make a ketchup and they make salad dressings. I'll, I'll bring in the name of it, but it's the gluten free life, maybe, uh, really good products. And I'm finding them even in the regular grocery stores now. So that's an amazing thing. Um, and he loves that Tuscan sun-dried tomato, uh, on, on a little bit of salad. He likes that. And, uh, we do a lot of frozen organic broccoli that gets us through a lot of different things. Uh, he will eat squash. We, he loves to do green beans last night for dinner. He had that chicken that we grilled. He had green beans, um, he had a half of a baked sweet potato and, um, I'm trying to think there was one, one more thing on the plate, but there was the protein was the chicken and, um, he had a little bit of a salad, but he had the green beans and he was very, I, he was very excited. He sat down and he said, I feel like I'm at Disneyland because Di Disneyland makes some really fabulous green beans that are really super healthy. So he loves those other vegetables that we do. We do carrots and sometimes we do them with like a dip, like the hummus, um, or just a tahini sauce. Um, and, uh, sometimes we cook the carrots and put a little spaghetti sauce on them. Uh, those are real big staples in our house. A, a, a good gluten-free spaghetti sauce, the day of cheese, uh, the array of different meats. Uh, we will cook a whole chicken. We do chicken legs and coat them with lemon juice and herbs and olive oil bake them until the, the meat is literally falling off the bones. That's a big thing that he likes to eat for dinner. We do meatloafs and we do turkey burgers. He, we have started allowing for the longest time, our, my son only ate two legged animals. That was our big thing was that I, I don't eat anything with legs. He would only eat two legs and my husband, you know, <laughs> there are no rules. Uh, but we are allowing Jem to have beef now. Uh, we're trying to make it very specific, very healthy beef. Um, but you know, and, and then occasionally we're allowing a little bit of pork, uh, because he's very into smoked things right now. We read, we're reading, uh, together, we're reading the little house in the big woods. Cause we, I want to this summer go through the, all of the little house in the prairie books. And they were talking in this book about smoking deer meat and smoking pig meat. And this was fascinating to him and he wanted to know more about it. And, you know, you always want to pair learning things, experiential things with the reading. And so we talked about smoked. So we had smoked salmon the other day. And we had smoked oysters the other day. He had the smoked salmon and said, I want that on a pizza. And we do make pizza at home. There is a, uh, a pizza parlor that we can order pizza from that's gluten-free and casein-free, but we make it at home. We use a Namaste pizza crust mix that doesn't have any sugar, doesn't have any yeast in it. Very easy to make. It's very flexible, very tasty with the spaghetti sauce, the day of cheese, and he wanted the smoked salmon on it as well, which I thought was pretty delicious. And sometimes we'll put other vegetables on it. Um, he loves mushrooms. I'm trying to think, uh, what else are the big faves? He loves eggplant. We love baba ganoush, which is the roasted eggplant dip. Oh, that with some carrots. Now see, I'm getting hungry now. Uh, so lots of different things. There are brown rice tortillas that we will make like a fajita with, uh, chicken strips and lots of pepper and he now will tolerate a little bit of onion. It was a little too tangy for him for a lot of years. And there are some great fajita sauces that you can get that's the same company. I, I think it is the Gluten Life, uh, Gluten Free Life. I'll check on that. Uh, but so we do a wide variety of different things and he is very into experimenting. Whenever we go to the store, he says, let's try something new. I want to, his new thing is that he wants to try squid. <sighs> Right? And I go, I don't know how to cook squid. I don't want to cook squid. I don't want to have to deal with it. But I'm, I can bet you dollars to donuts that I will be cooking squid sometime in the near future. 
what are you going to do? What, what we do for our children, right? Okay, so that is pretty much what he eats. And then in terms of snacks, um, occasionally we will do popcorn. In the summer, if I can find good organic non-GMO corn on the cob, not easy to do. This summer we're going to try to grow it ourselves. Um, then I will give him corn on the cob occasionally. He loves all fruits. We make popsicles out of blood oranges and um, he loves bubble water. So we uh, get seltzer that has lemon in it and you mix that with a little blood orange uh, and stick it in the freezer. It makes a fabulous popsicle that looks as red as anything that any other kid is eating. It's minimal calories but a little bit of vitamin C and a little bit of flavor. Uh, it's a very good thing. Um, trying to think what else. We don't do a lot of baked goods because uh, he just isn't as into them. Although I've promised that I would feature on the show, if you can get breads from Anna. Oh my goodness, those are the best mixes. They're gluten-free, they're casein-free, they have a little bit of honey in them. Uh, they are ridiculously good. I mean ridiculously good. The banana bread and the pumpkin bread, I have served those at functions where everybody in the room was not gluten-free and nobody even noticed. I think it's the best thing that I've ever found that's gluten-free. It's amazing. Moist. Oh. All right. I'm hungry. We should take a break. I am told that Carrie Magro is not going to be able to join us. Um, last minute uh, situation, but Carrie's not going to be able to join us today. So we hope that we'll be able to have him on on another day. Um, but we are going to have Ashley Colas joining us a little after the top of the hour. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back and talk about those three safety tips that everyone should know. So stick with us. Hi, welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Lisa Ackerman. Uh, we're here doing allergy-free cooking, and I brought my sister with me today. Jamie Davis, thanks and for having me. A lot of people are asking about a allergy-free breakfast, and breakfast can be full of crap. You know, it, breakfast, but it's full of cereal. crap, and it's hard to do. We yeah. don't have time in the morning. We're in a hurry. We're going completely nut-free. The recipe is not personality. Me. We can't do yeah, anything can't about. do anything about that. So we're going to start off first with um, I'm using sorghum and brown rice flour. It, I find the texture good, and I've added some flaxseed meal. We talked about that last time. Flaxseed meal for poop. Almost every one of our kids has a poop issue. What's next on the recipe is the quinoa flakes, baking powder, cinnamon, and the xanthan gum. It brings the glutinous texture back into the flour. And often, what happens with these recipes is they can fall apart. This one holds up nicely. I like it. For the folks that are egg free, we have a ton of egg replacers. One of those can be the arrowroot starch or bringing back some additional flax seeds. So there's a lot of options to go eggless, but we're going to go egg full in this one. For sweetener, I use the maple syrup. I stay away from refined sugar. What I'm adding now is the coconut. Uh, milk, maple syrup, and a little bit of the coconut oil. And we're going to add in the raisins, craisins, and chocolate chips at the end. To find that chocolate chips can coax people to eat some really amazing things. When we started, Jeff had 42 food allergies, so we had to get creative in how we cooked. So nuts were a big, big issue. What I like now is that he can tolerate so many more things after start doing this diet. So let me show you how you can deal with this um, sticky stuff here. You get your fingers really wet, and you can push it down. So my oven has been preheated. It's at um, 350 degrees. So we're going to just throw this in. Like I said, I like it around 23 minutes. And the magic oven says, I'm done. Looks like. Don't you love magic ovens? They're awesome. There we go. Pops right out. The texture of these, and it's so pretty. It looks almost like a big chocolate chip cookie, but you actually made it healthy. You can be wow. my guinea pig. Tell me what you think. It looks really good. Doesn't it? So the textures and the colors in there are just beautiful. So the raisins are for you, the chocolate chips are for your kid. I can't believe it's gluten free. I know, right? It doesn't taste like, you know, crap. crap. <laughs> <laughs> We're wrapping up another cooking show. If you have feedback, you can email us at autismlive at gmail.com. We're, of course, on Facebook. You could go to facebook.com slash autismlive. 
And of course, Taka now has thousands of recipes. Join me there, and we can um, cook some more later on. So thanks for joining us. You say hi, we say hi. Let's get right, let's get right, let's get right. Welcome back to Autism Live. We posted a blog this week called Three Things That Every Parent Should Know About Safety. And especially if you have a child on the autism spectrum, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. It's so important that we work on safety on a regular basis. And I Again, I, I say to everybody, I am not an expert in autism. I'm certainly not an expert in teaching safety uh, to children on the autism spectrum. But, you know, you learn some things along the way. And I think the three most important things that everybody needs to know, uh, very simply, that we want to rehearse, 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 that we want to strive for generalization. And the third thing is we want to reinforce desirable behavior. Those are the three most important things. And you can apply those to practically any child and any age teaching any safety lesson. So let's break it down, if we will. <laughs> um, if we start with rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. You know, being around the experts that I get to be around on a regular basis, and they all have different ways that they'll word it. Some people will say, you know, well, providing more teaching opportunities, more opportunities to try something out. Um, we've heard Dr. Jonathan Tarbox talk before about giving opportunity and immediate feedback is the key to teaching anything. And so many times we there's the frustration as an autism parent because things come up and in the moment we're not prepared for it right because we didn't know what was going to happen and then it's over the moment is over we didn't hit it right and it's gone like i feel that way about halloween when my kid would we would participate in halloween and the night would come and i'd be all excited for him to do it and then we'd go and new things would have cropped up from the year before and now it's over and now we got to wait a whole other year, and I couldn't get any ramp up to. And it was said to me early on, we want to rehearse, 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 rehearse. We all know in our, in our lives how important it is to rehearse things. Whether you're an actor and you're going to go and perform something on stage, you would never want to do it for the first time in front of an audience without ever having rehearsed it. What about if you're going to give a presentation in a meeting, you're going to have done a better job if you rehearse it. It's good for us for, if we're going to an IEP meeting as a parent to rehearse, this is what I want to say. We've had experts come on and say, you know, make your family members sit there and rehearse your speech that you're going to say at the IEP meeting so that you're more comfortable. It's never going to go exactly how you rehearsed it, right? But when things go awry, you're still going to have a base of here's what I wanted to say, and you'll be in a better place for having rehearsed it. It reduces the nerves. And I do think that there is muscle memory. It's the reason why we rehearse fire drills. Even here in this building, I know that sometime in the month of May, we're going to have an unannounced fire drill. We do several throughout the year, uh, disaster drills where we leave the building and we get notice about it. And then we work up to one a year where nobody knows it's going to happen. And we just, you know, it happens in the moment. Uh, so important because if you've ever been in an emergency situation, and I know at this point in my life, I've been in emergency situations many different times. There's so much going on in your head head, but your body still remembers, oh, I'm supposed to leave. <laughs> and you do. And you think to yourself, I don't even remember getting downstairs. I don't really know what happened. But your body kind of goes, well, this is what we do. That's what rehearsal does for us. And it gives us another opportunity to get it right. If we do the fire drill and we go, okay, that didn't go well, what would we change about the next time? And then a week later we do it again and we have that opportunity to see, can we get it right this time? I think about Olympic athletes and if they were going to go and compete in a meet at the, and the first one be the Olympics and they've never competed before, they're going to be at a disadvantage. Advantage, right? We all know if we've done something before that there are more things that we can concentrate on the next time. Well, the same thing is true for our kids. If we rehearse, rehearse, rehearse safety, it doesn't mean that we're absolutely going to get it done. But each time if we get a little closer, 
eventually we're either going to get to the point where we got it done and we're going to be that much closer to it, right? We always talk on the show about progress. Progress is everything. So rehearse. Think about all the different circumstances that you want your child to be safe around and all the different ways that you can rehearse them. Rehearse the fire drills. Rehearse the earthquake drills. Whatever else you have going on in, in your family, in your community, in your part of the wor world, rehearse the many different things. And then the next phase is to make sure, as we mentioned before earlier in the program, strive for generalization. No matter how much we rehearse, we're never going to cover the myriads of situations that may happen across a lifetime. So we make sure that we change things up on a regular basis and we teach basic rules and then we teach about when and how you might break the rule. That that there, here are the rules that we're going to listen. You know, if, if they come on the loudspeaker and say there's a fire, everybody move outside. The rule is you listen to the authorities and do that. However, you know, if this and so is happening, these are circumstances in which we break the rules, right? Um, so giving our children this very flexible idea about how to be safe. I remember years ago, somebody telling me about um, the Molly Brown syndrome that, uh, do you know who Molly Brown was? She was a woman who was on the Titanic, who also had been in a situation as a baby that she almost drowned. And she had come from, you know, living in the mountains and having nothing. She married a man and they struck it rich and found gold. And then she became somebody who toured the world. She was a very famous character. There's the Molly Brown house in Denver, Colorado, that you can go and visit and tour. She was very progressive for her time at the turn of the century, very outspoken woman. Uh, but she was somebody who was known for being a survivor, that she kept a cool head in circumstances and she had many things happen across her lifetime, not just the Titanic and not just almost drowning as a child, but she became synonymous with surviving. And there is this uh, theory called the Molly Brown syndrome of people who are able to survive circumstances. And do you know, and they studied people who had survived like 9-11 and lots of different circumstances to figure out what mindset, what personality is most likely to survive disasters. And it's people who think ahead, people who look at a scenario and say, here are my options. What am I going to do? And they discovered that most of those people were people who had been talked to as a child and said, what if this were going to happen? Let's play this game of, you know, somebody comes in and says that they're robbing the store. What would we do? Now, my family, we all laughed about this because this was my grandmother. She would take us to a coffee shop when I was a very little girl and we'd be sitting there in the coffee shop and she would say, imagine that a masked man came in with a gun right now. The thing you would never want to say to a small child, right? We would make fun of her for it. But she would say, what would we do? Where would we exit? And it taught me very young as a child to look, okay, where are the exits? Every time I'm in a movie theater, I look and see where are the exits. If something were, gonna, were going to happen, what would we do? And as horrible as my grandmother was at saying these things, there is an element of this that's really important for all of us and important for our kids. And the Molly Brown syndrome proves it, that if you are taught to look at scenarios and say, if something were to happen, not instilling fear, not causing children to constantly be looking over their shoulder, but just noticing. And it is something that I do with my child. We go into a movie theater and I always say to him, so where are the exits? Can you see the exit signs? Early when he was little, I would say, look for the E. Where do you see the big red E? I spy a big red E. And then it was, you know, looking for the rest of the letters and it was spelling out the word. Can you read what that sign says? And it says exit. But still now at this age, almost 10, I go in and say, so where are the exits? in this place. He gets exasperated when he's like, mom, I know where the exits are, right? But it became very important when we were in a, a theater two summers ago that they had a small fire. Everyone was fine, but it was very interesting to me how my son reacted, how my husband reacted, how I reacted, as opposed to everybody else in the movie theater. The alarms went off and we got up and started moving to the exit. And there were only maybe two other families that started to move towards the exit. Everybody else sat there. And my son said, don't they know there is a fire drill? They're supposed to be moving towards the exit. And we had just gotten to the door when somebody from the theater came in and said, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a drill. There is a fire in the building. Everybody 
security needs. And then people were crawling over each other and we were already out the door. Uh, so key to instill in our children to understand, cause someday my child's going to go to a movie theater by himself. And I want him to know fire alarm goes off. This is what you do. And this is where the exit is. And you don't sit there and keep watching the movie. Um, you would think it would go without saying, but it doesn't. So striving for generalization, picking those different circumstances, especially when nothing is going on. That's the ideal time to talk about what would we do if when nothing is going on. And then of course, the last thing on our list of three most important things to know is to reinforce desirable behavior. That whenever our children are engaged in safe behavior, that we reinforce them for it. And when they rehearse safe behavior, we reinforce them for it. We never want to make it scary. We never want to make it something that they're dreading. We always want to make it fun. If you're doing the fire drill, make it fun. It's not the actual circumstance. We're not making light of a fire, but if we don't instill in our children, here are the rules and it's a good thing to do. And and it always ends in a pleasurable feeling. They're not going to want to rehearse it. They're not going to want to generalize the skill. So if you're doing the fire drill and, and everybody goes out to the curb and everybody's safe and you've run the drill, make sure that that you're making it fun while it's happening as fun as you possibly can and that you reinforce it immediately afterwards with good things. Maybe everybody comes back in the house and watches a family movie so that they feel safe. We're not trying to scare our children. We're trying to teach them good habits for a lifetime to be aware in their space, to understand what to do in a variety of different circumstances and to be self-possessed in those moments, to have a list of things of, well, here's what I can do. Here's what I should do. Who, here's who I should listen to. And um, in that way, you know, we can't ever, and, and, and we've all seen this time and time again in the last year, we're never 100% able to keep our kids safe. I think it's one of the greatest uh, miseries of being a parent is knowing that, you know, you can't, there's, it doesn't matter what you do. There, there's never the possibility of keeping them 100% safe. But if we prepare them in this way with these tools, then we can sleep easier knowing that we've done our jobs and that hopefully armed with this information, our kids can move through a world that we hope and pray will get more peaceful. So very important that we take the time to instill these th three things. Rehearse strive for generalization and reward and reinforce that really good behavior always. All right, we're going to take a break and go to the A word. This is an amazing documentary being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders following a little boy, Jack Riley, as he ventures through his intensive ABA intervention. He's about nine months into therapy at this point, and he is acquiring skills at such a rapid rate that it's nothing short of miraculous. But there are always difficulties along the way, things, adjustments that have to be made. There's starting to work on intensive safety issues with him. And as he gains more language and gains more independence, uh, we, were gonna, we are going to see more frustration on his part when he can't have his way. That's all a part of growing up. And it, that's true for kids who are on the spectrum and kids who are not on the spectrum. So take a look. This is the A word. Every month, Jack Riley's case supervisor, therapists, and parents meet to check in with one another. During clinic, they determine what skills have been mastered and what new lessons should be added. Put the line under the truck. <laughs> Where'd it go? Size and make sure that the, the 
objects that you're using, like the reference object or the, the target item that has to manipulate, is not something that's too fun because then you want him to start playing with it. So just sort of keep it neutral items. In the lesson prepositions, they first start with on top, since Jack Riley can clearly see what's being referenced. Once he understands that preposition, they'll include more complex ones, such as underneath or behind. The reason those are complex is that the child cannot see what is being referenced. Do you know how many Tonka trucks your dad had? Can you take a statement point? In the hall. About the time I was 40, I didn't think I was going to have any kids. <laughs> In this lesson, they are stringing together mastered labels to make sure Jack Riley remembers them all. This exercise works on his language fluency. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you did it! Yeah, there's a sticker. Hey, he was so proud of himself. Yeah. And it's a little like half video. smirk. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> like, there you go. ago when we first saw Jack Riley independently tagged with joint attention and in that time he's become a lot more vocal. Jack Riley is needing less prompting to speak and his speech isn't only reserved for manding but is becoming more and more social. He wants to engage others in his experience instead of using people only as tools to receive objects that he wants. What do you... Why I vote? Can... Can I vote? Can you say, can I have? Can I have? Okay, you say, can I have? Say, can I have? Say, can I have? Say, have? Can I have? Good trying, buddy. That's a good try. Here you go. Kind of all slurred there. It's okay. So that's um, a new target we have in man's. We're trying to expand his frames of asking for things because he's so good about saying, I want and um, give me. So we want him to start asking in different ways. So um, Sabrina wanted us to start teaching him, can I have, or, and then we'll expand to, may I have. As you saw in clinic, she wants us to work on fluency too. And he's getting a lot better with the it's a item. Um, I don't know if you remember like footage from like months ago when we were doing labels and all he wanted to say was the object, like he didn't want to um, say it's a uh, at all. What is it? Uh, say it's a chicken. Yeah, it's a chicken. Good job. Two more stickers. Look. What do you mean by language fluency? Oh, um, so that um, when he speaks, it's more, um, it's more fluid, it's not like broken up, and um, it's not slurred either. Right. Can I have Yay! There you go, buddy! Very good! That was very good. He picked it up really fast. 
still slur, but nonetheless, it's still pretty good. But I guess, he, as you can see, like, through your footage, like, he picks up things in, like, a couple trials, and he already knows it. <laughs> All right, my turn. <laughs> Do you want more penguin? More penguin. Okay. It's a pillow. It's a pillow. It's a red. It's a pillow. It's a pillow. It's a pillow. It's a slide. It's a, it's a slide. It's a slide. There you go. Nice job. Thanks. It's a potato. Good. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a carrot. Good boy. It's a toothbrush. Good job. It's a wee bug. Uh -huh. it's, it's, a, it's a couch. Good boy. That was really good. He's really getting those um, ending sounds in the words. It's really good. Yeah, the way he articulates... Um, the, um, the different sounds in the words, because a lot of those words are really hard to say. Um, it's really good compared to what it was like when we initially taught him. And I know we added the words that he can't articulate very well in a coex, and I guess that helped too, but um, just hearing the fluency and the way he says it is really good. <laughs> I'm impressed. But he seems like he's really trying to. Yeah, and he makes all the sounds in the words now. Versus, you know, he'll just slur the words like before. Like, um, what word did he say? It was really good. I don't remember. But, like, chicken would have been, like, like a slurred word. Like, I don't know. I, I don't even remember. But it's like shishu. Shishu. Yeah, but he really tries to articulate every sound now. Especially the ending sounds, too. Like cat and dog. Like, he, he really tries. It's really good. A lot of progress. Where you going? Huh? You, you want to show us my dick, Ready? Are you a bobblehead? So lucky. Huh? What? Whoa. What? Whoa, whoa. What? What? Say it again. Are you saying something? What? 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 So you're a monkey? What? Aww. Okay, I'm here. What? You want to look? Look. See, I want to look. I want to look. Okay. <laughs> what do you want to see? Can you sing to the camera? Can you Wait, sing? look at who, who, who is that? Jack Riley. Jack Riley? Can Jack Riley say hi? That was the A word, and I want to encourage you to watch this entire series. We take one episode per week and, and show it to you and give you opportunities, like we were saying with our kids, to see something over and over and over again. But I, at this point in the series, they have enough footage that you are really able to watch and see the scope of this is where this child started. This is where they introduced this skill. This is where this skill started to be mastered. This is where this skill was generalized. This is where they're going with it. And I can't say enough how valuable that is. And not only is it valuable if you're a parent working with a child on the spectrum, we have heard from individuals who have autism themselves and, and have seen the progression and it helps them to realize when they're working on something how the progression happens and how much help and support that they can get in this way. And I think it's worthwhile to show it to family members. If you are starting or have been doing this kind of intervention in your home and you've got in-laws or family members who aren't understanding what you're doing, you know what I mean, the kind of people who are calling you up saying, I just don't know why you don't have as much time for me anymore, um, or family members who are wanting to come and stay with you for four weeks and don't understand what it is that you're doing, I encourage you to have them watch a little bit of this series, if not all of this series, to say, this is the kind of thing that we're doing in our home. It really, it condenses it down. You know, obviously they're not showing you every single thing that has happened, but it condenses it down in a really intelligent way so that someone can see, ah, this is how they're teaching this little boy. This is how they're teaching individuals with spectrum new on the spectrum, new skill, skills. Really 
super uh, interesting, entertaining to watch, but important that people understand what can happen with our children. If you look at the early, early episodes with Jack Riley, and he is so interested in things and not in people, loves his mom, is happy to sit on his mom's lap and hug, hug and cuddle with his mom, but he's got a toy there and he's playing with the toy and mom is saying his name and he might as well not hear her. He is not interested in what she has to say. And even when he's interested in what she has to say, he's not looking up at her face. That's not the thing that's really reinforcing to him. But if you look at this week's episode and you see that the shift has been made where he is still interested in things. I mean, he still wants that iPhone. <laughs> you know, he still wants to see that camera. He, you know, very reinforced by those things. But he's also making eye contact with the people around him. And he's saying their names and he's engaging with them and wanting to play with them. He knows that that's as much fun as those things. That in and of itself is amazing for this little boy and the things that it's going to lead to and the, and the building blocks that that has, has created so that he can get those harder social skills down the road. He's going to be willing to work on those things because he knows it's worth it at this point. Uh, so important that, you know, it really is that staircase of, oh, you add this skill and then you get to the harder one. But if our kids don't have those base skills, it can make it really frustrating for them. So this little boy, very reinforced by people now. And when we look at the things that we're reinforcing to him, like the pillow sandwich that they do with him, seems like a silly thing, but it's there's nothing silly about it. That's what's reinforcing to that individual child. That's when he started to make eye contact with them because he would do something and they, he would make the eye contact and they would squish him with the pillows and he loved that. they squish him with the pillows and lay him down on the bed. He'd do that a thousand times. Times. Now, for my child, that wouldn't have done it. The squishing with the pillows wouldn't have done it at all. For him, and I've talked about before on the show, they made paper swords and they would do the sword fight and they would only do the sword fight with him when he would make eye contact with them. And suddenly he was interested in them because it led to something that was reinforcing to him. This little boy loves the iPhone. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And they say, do you, and she tempts him. She says, here's the iPhone. Do you want to work for the iPhone? And, the, and he reaches for it and she just takes it and puts it behind her back. She's not trying to tease him. There's a difference between tempting somebody and teasing somebody with something. She says, you want to play with the iPhone? Yeah. He says, okay, then we're going to do this. And she has made whatever this is as interesting and as exciting as it can be. And as soon as he gets it, there's the iPhone. Woohoo! So this little boy loves working with her. And, and we see that he has gone from, I, I wanted to take a second and talk about the label thing because many of you have written in and said, in my child's IEP, they have, you know, that they're going to gain 30 more labels, but my child's not talking and using them conversationally. Why is it useful for my child to be able to say mouse unless my child knows how to say, give me the mouse. I want to find something. Right. And we see the progression here that they made it fun for him. They reinforced, he did labels, then they lengthened it. So now he's not just saying lamp. He's saying it's a lamp. Oh, how lovely is that? Because down the road, when they're working on functionality and they put down the cards and say, which one of these things can make a dark room uh, more light? And he picks it up and says, the lamp can make it light right? So that eventually down the road, they're going to say something to him and he's going to have in a sentence, you know, let's turn on the lamp and be in a conversation. Uh, so important that we don't just teach labels, that we're constantly like that pizza dough, stretching these kids out, um, building their skills, moving in a direction. Yet yeah, he's not making conversation yet. That has not escaped his, his notice, his parents notice, the therapist notice, but they're building towards it right? Uh, we would never expect somebody to do a triple backflip without first teaching them how to do a backward somersault. So important that we start with teaching labels, but there's so many more steps along the way. <sighs> I do love this series. <laughs> As I encourage you, check it out.
invite others to check it out. If there's somebody who is not on board with your team and you're doing ABA in your household, ask them to watch the A word. Say, I really want you to check this out. This family is doing what we're doing and I want you to see how important it is what we're doing. Very exciting uh, series. Very beneficial to all of us. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, I believe that we're going to be joined by Ashley Colas. And it's always good stuff with Ashley. So stick with us. When you find out you're having a boy, you always think like, oh, he's going to play football. He's going to do this and that. And then when he's diagnosed, all those things get washed away. It's like that piece that's always in the back of your mind, you know, where is he, what is he doing, is he safe? We really didn't know what we were dealing with. I wish that they could have directed me a little bit more and provided me some information. I was a young mom. I didn't know what it was like to raise a boy despite a boy with autism. Hundreds of thousands of families are not getting the help they need for their children with autism all around the country. Act Today is determined to bridge the gap. These families really have to go through a lot to get a grant. The application process isn't easy. The records, the diagnosis proof, they're really battling for their kids. So when we can give them a grant, it is so wonderful to see that they succeed in getting that help for their children. Our founder, Dr. Doreen Grampiche, is an amazing woman. And she is one of the world's foremost authority on behavior of children with autism. She's extremely knowledgeable and she oversees every single grant we give. She is part of that process. People may think of autism care and treatment as simply schooling or therapy, but you know, we provide important safety supports. Things like fencing, for example. The whole family's living in fear of that child running out into traffic. I recently delivered an iPad to a little boy with some of the apps that are out there for children with autism. Miracles happen. I got the iPad from an act. From act. What yeah. did it say? Can you repeat that, Dustin? I got the iPad from that. We have helped so many military families. And when I think of these brave families that are fighting two battles, one to protect our country and one for the right treatment and care for their children, it, it breaks my heart. And I think we have to do more as a nation to help them. There's not a day that doesn't go by that we don't think about it. Some people say, oh, he's normal. You don't see the battles that I see every single day. My husband does have to deploy, and when they get on that bus, that might be the last time that my kids ever see them. So I called, and then they informed me that he had received the grant, which was like a blessing from above. I was just like speechless. I just started to cry because, you know, without it, we would, we would have been lost. The ACT grant was a total miracle, and without that, they wouldn't be able to receive the service dog. So we're so appreciated what they've done for us as a family. Recently, ACT Today funded a program for military children with autism in San Diego, the Inclusion Films Program, which is run by Joey Travolta, and teaches uh, kids on the autism spectrum literal filmmaking skills. They learn how to make a movie. Everybody? There you go. Got it. Okay. Everything that goes into the process of making a film goes into everyday life. So they're learning life skills, they're learning to collaborate. It was really nice to know how much they were enjoying this camp. And they're with people who are supporting them and they're making them feel great about themselves and their differences and their similarities. And I get two kids that are working together and apart and together and apart. So it's an interrelationship as well as a camp and a learning experience. It's so fulfilling when I get letters. One stands out for me, a, a boy who was 14 with Asperger's, and we gave him a grant to go to a drama camp. He wrote to us and said, Dear Act Today, thank you for letting me belong for the first time in my life. These kids are remarkable. You know, we underestimate them. They're so knowledgeable. They're so capable. And we can change the life of a family, which means changing the life of a community.
Welcome back to Autism Live. So thrilled that we once again have Ashley Colas joining us for Good Stuff with Ashley. And first of all, I have to apologize to you because last week you were here and we had so many other guests on the show that we ran out of time for you to be here, but you came and you were here and we didn't get to you. And so I so apologize because uh, your time is so valuable to me. I want you to know that. Um, so thrilled that you're willing to come back this week. And you also, the, the weeks before, you were away. Tell everybody where you were. I did go away. I went for a vacation or a holiday a a vacay as we call it (laughs) yes Um, and I went to South Africa Uh and I went to I flew into Johannesburg Mm -hmm. and I stayed there for a day and met up with some uh, a friend that I met when I was doing ABA in Dubai that is actually from Johannesburg and got to see her new baby Uh and then we journeyed on to Durban Mm -hmm. and we attended a wedding for other friends that we'd met in Dubai that also We're working on ABA and um, back to Johannesburg for an Easter celebration Wonderful. and to pet some baby white lion cubs, which was amazing, and feed giraffes. and. Yeah, so you guys see. did go on safari. It's like Just a... Like that. It's, um, I'm not ready for a real safari. I think yeah. those don't have the cages on the side. <laughs> and so Scary. we went to like a wild animal park. Okay. So they're... they're it's it's giant. It's a massive area, and they have different sections for like wild, the game and um, the lions and the cheetahs and the oh wild goodness. dogs and all that kind of stuff. And you go around, and your your jeep does have a cage. And okay. we had a lion, a lioness or a female lion come up, and she was quite aggressive. And eyeing this little boy in front of me that was eating candy and taking pictures of her with his iPad. Uh huh. And so, I'm really glad that was on there because she was yeah. like, she would have gotten on. The Jeep. Because they think she that our kids side, are lunch. Yeah. yeah, he looks like a little... Yeah, lunch. little treat for her, I'm sure. <laughs> he looks like a Lunchable yeah, to her. Yeah, and he actually growled at her, and he went, uh, and she roared. And we were oh. all like, okay, we're so excited. We got to hear the, the roar, but now we're scared. So. Right. Aren't we glad we have a cage? <laughs> yes. We're, so uh. that was my first, you know, attempt towards maybe building up to a safari at some point, but yeah. that was... I think I'll probably need a little bit more time at the wild animal parks before I'm ready to go out. Yeah. You know, on the. Because we've been invited to come to South Africa, and, uh, you know, my son really wants to go. Jem thinks that would be fun, and he wants to go on safari. And I, of course, I don't, I don't think that there's enough Valium for me yeah. to get on the plane, let alone to be on safari. Um, just knowing that a lion would look at him as lunch, uh, that's going to keep me up. But. <laughs> Yeah. But in any case, thrilled to have you back and so great that you went and had a good time. And you were on vacation, but it was all autism associated. There it were was. people that you did ABA with, and they uh, you had the opportunity to see they have the Star Academy there. I, we got to drive by, but I got to meet all the wonderful therapists at oh. Star Academy. And they, they came to have a dinner with me my first night, which oh. was really nice and I got to talk with them and of course I want to give them all my time and tell them everything I know and (laughs) give them all the trainings that they want and they're amazing and they run on these tanks full of passion because Uh, they don't make a lot of money and a lot less than our therapists make here so they're doing their job because they love it and they're putting in all this time because they love it and they go to really unsafe parts of South Africa that we wouldn't want to go to and they don't want to go to either but because they're passionate about helping these kids so I was just overcome by that uh, how much dedication and compassion I saw in these people and it was amazing amazing. well and I I just have to say you know for people who are watching and if you know people who are looking for a career in their life and we talk from time to time about how there is job security and working with children on the autism spectrum we see the number of children affected going up you know Unfortunately, that is the reality, but the flip of it is is that there is job security, right. and it is a very rewarding job. It isn't for everyone. You no, have to be not. somebody who gets very passionate about helping children, and sometimes it's long, arduous hours, yeah. and uh, being very specific. You cannot be a therapist and phone it in. I always say to people, you know, if you're somebody who, who wants to go to work and sometimes just be on autopilot, being an ABA therapist is not going to be the deal for you. Yeah. You only have to go on autopilot once and maybe get 
you know, bops in the face, and yeah. then you'll you'll make a decision whether you're gonna, you know, be yeah. present when you're yeah. and stay in that job, or if it's not for you. Yeah. So I think that you're absolutely right. It is something that you need to you need to know that you want to do, or you need to go into it and really give it all the effort to try it out yes. to begin with. But um, it is a good it is a good career, and it's extremely gratifying to see yeah. our kids make progress, even small gains. I think sometimes the small gains in ch children who are slower learners yeah. are <clears throat> just huge things yeah. for us because you have to work so hard to get that small change. Yeah. And I always think about the fact that when we quantify things, um, it, it really is a disservice, but we all do. We think of things of, well, you know, what's big progress and what's little progress, but it's all relative. It is. Absolutely. You know? And when it, when a child who is 10 years old, who has never been been able to use a toilet before uses a toilet that's not a small thing right it's significant to the individual so yes. for for like a seven-year-old girl to learn to toilet yeah is quite significant but there might be another child that's working on reading comprehension exactly and so they're different but they're significant based on their Absolutely. their current skills and what they're doing yeah. on a daily basis. And also what their parents feel is important and what, yes. what's important culturally. Absolutely. So for a child that practices a different religion, yeah. and um, I had a child in the Middle East that was learning to pray, yeah. and they're a Muslim family, and it was really important to his father that he could go to um, the mosque with him. Yeah, and so, of course. Yeah, so he learned to do it, and we practiced and that kind of stuff, and it was really significant in that culture for Absolutely. him to have that what a wonderful Skill. thing. And, but I also want to point out that here are all these places that you've been able to travel to. Um, you know, they used to have those commercials about, you know, join the Navy, join the Army, and right. see the world, right? Well, you don't have to. You could be an ABA therapist and see right, the world. Right, absolutely. And have a little bit more flexibility in your life. Not that there's anything wrong with joining the Armed Forces, but, you know, there are other options here. So you've been to Dubai, and uh, and now you've been to South Africa, and, uh, and we should say... You you know, I talk all the time on the show about Peter Farrig. Peter Farrig, and see, I'm going to get all the clumped here. But Peter Farrig was the first therapist who ever come to my door, and we do refer to him as the autism whisperer. And I've said for years, Peter is a part of my family forever and ever. And Ashley is is joining that family. You already have yes. joined that family because you and Peter are getting married in the yes. fall. We couldn't be happier for both of you. I'm so thrilled that he found the right girl, and we're so thrilled to have you in the family. You're just Thank a wonderful so addition. And you've been in the family now for a while. Thank you, But yeah. I don't think we've disclosed that before on the show, that Ashley and Peter are getting married in the fall. I have said for years, I can't wait to bounce your babies on my knee. I know. Uh, and I get uh, all misty here. Uh, but if ever two people deserved happiness, it is the two of Thank you, you because so of all the happiness that together you guys have given families over the years. Ugh, I'm just a mess now. Um, so very thrilled about that. And Peter has been going to South Africa yes, and consulting there. there quite often yes there's a great group here that um works abroad mostly yes and they're doing some amazing things and we have a lot of things um cooking right now yeah. trying to get into other areas yeah and these are areas that i think when star academy started out there wasn't really anyone yeah so um and now i believe they have three centers uh -huh. or four maybe uh -huh. and so um they have just grown exponentially, yeah. and uh, Peter has been part of that. He has amazing cultural sensitivity, like yeah. innate, because yes. his family is, you know, from Egypt, and uh -huh. they have some traditions in their culture, yes. so he just has, he has it in him. He's been really good at that. And, and he's a sensitive uh, soul. He is. Like, you, you know, you meet Peter, and Peter is a big guy who has an intimidating presence. Yeah. And, you know, Deep voice. but, but yes, um, but he is the soul of sensitivity. Right. And uh, really one of the best people I've ever met at the perspective taking and getting inside kids' heads to figure out what's going to be the thing that gets right. done. So uh, we really couldn't send instincts. somebody better. Right. Uh, you know, really kind of amazing. But he's so he's been going to South Africa. Where else has he been going to? Um, to he's been going to Jordan. Uh -huh. 
Um, he's been a couple other places. Obviously, I've been to Dubai. Yeah. Um, you were both practicing in Dubai both for were there. Two, yeah. what, two years, right? Yeah. Amazing. Yes. So I actually have a friend. I was telling you I was excited to talk about something. My yeah. friend that I worked with in Dubai is an uh -huh. amazing ABA therapist. Uh -huh. And she left with her fiancé, and they recently got married. I was uh -huh. at their wedding. And she started a... A, com a business called Hands on Autism, and that's Ooh. out of Botswana. Wow. Really amazing because there is, I mean, we say there was nothing in South Africa. There was nothing wow. in Botswana. So this is part of this this effort to uh, raise, wi raise awareness yes. and to um, train people to yeah. help others and to help kids get services. Yeah. She's doing a really amazing thing. And so she actually um, ran the Light It Up Blue campaign. I believe they were blue lanterns that they let oh. go, but it was thousands of people. And this oh. one little bubbly, amazing person, she's got the best personality. I hope we can have her on, maybe yes. Skype with her sometime. Yes, I would love to. She is so passionate, and you cannot help but be like really excited around her. Oh, but she's awesome. gotten thousands of people to be excited about helping wow. kids and families. So In she's Botswana. done an amazing thing. And Botswana. Wonderful. So that's where I want to go next. I'm like, yeah. sign me up for that one because oh, I awesome. met a bunch of really lovely people from there so um I don't, I'm going to admit that I'm geographically challenged. I don't even know where Botswana is. It's in Africa. It, so it is in Africa. <laughs> there's this a lot of little, that I, like I, I yeah. admit to be, you know, there's lots of things I do know. Geography, I, I am a ditz. It's right north of South Africa. So okay. when you're flying over, you'll see, you know, you fly over Botswana and there's Gabron, which is a big city there. Uh -huh. And then you'll go right down into South Africa. This is how challenged I am. If it's not on a risk board, I have no idea where it is. Yeah. If it's on a you risk board, at, like I know where the Congo countries. is, I know where Irkutsk is, but if it's yeah. not on a risk board, help me. Oh, it's so bad to be so ignorant. Uh, I need to, well, you know, you it changes. It, with, it with looks, the map looks hill. different. Yes. Well, he's at the point where he's studying geography, so he explains to me, but the map looks different than when I was a kid and took geography class. Yeah. That's my excuse. They have so I'm many tiny countries yeah. in, South, in Africa yeah. that it's hard and some of them are really hard to pronounce oh, okay. and then even when you're in when we're in South Africa everything says like KwaZulu Natal and I'm like what is that what does that mean so you have to learn about different regions and all those okay. things so it's part of being there you wouldn't know what from just looking at the thing. map either okay fascinating well we should take a break and then when we come back we're going to have you talk about some safety stuff with yes. us we're very looking forward to that so stick with us after these messages we'll be back What do you think about ABA treatment? ABA is the one that's documented, but I think that's what I think is important for little kids, the intensity. If this kid's two, three, and four years old, he needs 20 or 30 hours a week of intensive early intervention, working one-to-one -one with an effective teacher. Mm -hmm. And an effective teacher knows kind of how just hard to push, because you've got to stretch these kids. Mm -hmm. If you don't stretch them somewhere, they don't advance. Mm -hmm. You push them on them too hard, they go into sensory shutdown. The worst thing you could do with an autistic two-year-old is to do nothing with them and just let them sit there rocking. And when I was very young, at two and a half, ABA-type things were used on me, but it wasn't called ABA in that day. Right. You know, my teacher would hold up a cup and she'd speak slowly. You've got to speak slowly to these kids because there's auditory processing problems. You'd say cup. And then I'd say cup and, and the teacher would praise me. You know, that's very similar to ABA. You know, ABA in its, um, you know, original form is a little kid's program. The whole idea is you're trying to get language jump-started. And I like the more flexible kinds of ABA. You've got different levels of kids. Mm -hmm. um, once, I mean, I had ABA type stuff when I was young, but mm -hmm. then after I pulled out of it, I didn't have to go through elaborate things of getting ready for school. I still have this habit now today. I lay my clothes out the night before that I'm going to wear, mm -hmm. so when I'm sleepy, I can just get them on. And then you have other individuals where they've got to do very structured you know, uh, you know, breaking down the task analysis. This is where after you get out of the little kids and you get them talking, they kind of diverge into yeah. different levels of functioning. And a type of ABA program that'd be suitable for a very severe kid would not be something you'd want to do with a mild Asperger kid because you're going to bore them to death and make them hate school. Absolutely. <laughs> 
Welcome back to Autism Live. Our very special guest in the studio with us today is Ashley Colas. Ashley is uh, a professional who has worked with children on the autism spectrum for many, many years now, even though you are such a young thing. But how, what, it's more than four years? That yeah, I think working? this is going on six years. Okay. The majority of my working life, so. Yes, uh, pretty amazing. And we just were talking about how you uh, have traveled as, as uh, somebody who's been working with children on the spectrum. And we have you come in on Thursday to share good stuff with us. Yes. And today, we've been talking about safety all this week, and so you're going to talk with us about cyber safety. Right. And that's, I'm so excited because I I need someone to have this talk with me. So I'm thrilled that you're going to be talking about this. Okay, good. I'm glad. <laughs> it's, cyber safety is something that's really serious, and it's yes. important to me um, because I've seen people go through identity theft and issues with um, especially teens or preteens mm -hmm. being in contact with in inappropriate individuals that could end up yeah. being a predatory situation or might have been a predatory situation. Yeah. Um, so it's something that's very serious and we are, are in an age where um, Everything from just communicating with others to education is digitized and we're yeah. using technology and we're using computers. Your yeah. phone is a computer, um, your laptop is a computer. All these things have a lot of capabilities and the internet has opened us up to so many yeah. opportunities, yeah. but also has made us m very vulnerable to, um, <clears throat> to dangers. And so... We and I don't think I fully get that as an adult. And, and my child, who gets much more about computers than I do, I, I don't think I have a full grasp on what he's open to on the right. computer. And that's very <clears throat> scary to me. Right. And that's something that's important. And I, I've talked about this with other parents, too, is you have to educate yourself. And so when, when we talk about technology being successful, even in, for our children at home or in a classroom, we have to be educated and we have yeah. to know how to use it yeah. so that we can understand the best ways to use it and the safe ways to use it. Um, so that's are you really saying, important. Ashley, that I need to learn how to play Minecraft because... <laughs> That may tip me over the edge. Uh, but this is one of the things that I'm worried about. My child right. is obsessed with Minecraft. Like so many of your kids out there, if they're playing on the computer, Minecraft is a big game that all the kids are playing, but especially our kids on the spectrum are very into it. And I was recently at a birthday party, and you know how the moms congregate at a certain point and they start talking about things, and everybody, it was a Minecraft party with a Minecraft cake, wow. and which is what a certain person has asked for this year for his birthday party, right? And, every, and there were some moms who had younger kids were like, I don't really know what this is. And everybody started talking about it uh -huh. and sharing horror stories about them being on a server with people who were saying things. And Right. So when you think about that, what are the dangers that you, th what, that you think are imminent? What do you think is going on? Well, I think, uh, you know, we've talked with him about, you never say your real name. You Absolutely. never tell anybody where you live. You never tell anybody how old you are. You never answer personal questions and you don't give out personal information. We've gone over what those things are. And I think feel like he gets that and we quiz him on it on a regular basis. But what I, what I haven't said to him that I feel like I need to go back and say, people will write and say other things to him right. that are just like swear words or, Absolutely. or using phrases. Um, so that my child recently asked me what the word rape meant mm. right. And it was because it got used in the context of this game. And I was Horrified. Absolutely. Horrified. I can't even imagine. I think that will be a tough day when I have a child that asks me something like that. But you touch on two really important things. So one is sharing of information, private yeah. information. So we have to talk to our kids about making sure that they don't give out their real name, yeah. where they live. They're also not using apps that can identify um, using like sat GPS um, oh my gosh, where how they do you are. know whether that is? How so we can, we'll talk about that, how okay. to be safe with your apps, because we talk about apps all the time, yes. and, and I'm saying, buy this app, this is awesome, or yes. you want to make sure that they're still safe, and there are certain things that you can do to keep okay. yourself safe, okay. with just the settings on your device. Okay. Um, so sharing of information, also sharing that with marketing companies, you become yes. a target, and you'll see when you log on to the internet, or you go into your browser, you'll see all these ads things that you've looked at recently and it's yeah. kind of creepy so that kind of stuff will come <laughs> it up it is creepy um and also you 
run the risk of identity theft. Yeah. So that's a big thing. I recently had one of my email accounts that was compromised, and I'm really good about trying to keep my passwords different. Right. But it just, something happened, and yeah. someone logged in from Argentina. Oh, my So you goodness. never know where they are either. Yeah. And they can see my emails and stuff. So that's, Oof. yeah, it's, it's kind of scary. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that you talked about was exposure to inappropriate content. Yeah. So we're talking about sexual content or um, inappropriate language yeah. or stuff that's violent in nature. Yeah. So all of those things we do need to talk to our kids about. They're going to hear it at school, potentially. Yeah. They're going to potentially see it on TV or in even a movie poster when you're walking by yes. the theater at the mall. Yes. You know, there's... There's a lot of things out there that they're going to be exposed to. You can't block them from everything. Right. We're not in a completely controlled environment. But we, those are things that we can talk to them about, about um, not, not interacting with individuals who are using certain yeah. types of language. Yeah. Um, and we can also monitor what they're doing. And that's yeah. an important thing. Kids... You know, they want privacy at a certain age. I don't know if your son's asking you about asking oh, yes, privacy Oh, yes, recently. Yet. Yeah, that's a big deal. But I do believe that within the Internet, parents need to really be interacting with their child and sharing time with their child on the Internet, yeah. sharing an email account with their child. They sh if your child is of a certain age, below a certain age, uh -huh. they probably should not have their own email right. with a private password. You should have access. Yeah. Um, and the things that you can look out for as far as inappropriate contact with individuals is people calling your phone yeah. um, that you don't know of adults and asking for your child um, that could, that's another indication that your information could have gotten out or someone could have gotten their name or for right. marketing or something like that yeah um, it's a scary world it is scary but the, and, and I think when it adds when you add something new to it <laughs> I think it's extra scary because there's an unknown thing I know on some of my things on the computer like I know on my blogs that I can go in and I can put a list of words and say these words are blocked and anybody who's using these words does not get to interact with my right. blog mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that with Minecraft like I don't know how to go in yeah. and say if somebody on the server is using the word rape mm -hmm. then they can't cannot talk to my son and I, I don't even know that that exists and I don't know who to run to to ask. Yeah, and I can't tell you if that exists for Minecraft. Mm -hmm. I would try to um, do a search on the internet to figure out whether okay. there's a safe browser for that's doing my, yeah. using Minecraft. But what might happen is, and that's one of the things I want to talk to you about, something that's a good thing, it's part of my good stuff, is using safe browsers. And there's ones available okay. for kids. Okay. Um, some AT&T, I believe, has a program that offers internet safety education for kids, teens, and parents. Okay. And also safe browsers. Okay. And I think um, PBS Kids has a program. I believe it iTunes has a ton of really awesome browsers, and you kind of have to look and read the reviews, what parents say okay. about it, and that will filter stuff. Okay, but great. what could happen is you buy this browser, a safe browser, and uh, Minecraft is not available not because it's... <laughs> It might not be. It might not have the filters right. that it needs to make it yeah. appropriate. So it might be something that just you need to spend time with him when he's playing. Yes, kind of, you know, sitting near him or listening to what's going on, and which is overwhelms me, right? Because I don't get it. It's not reinforcing to me, but I'm just gonna have to suck it up. Um, because it's his safety. Otherwise, right. he doesn't get to play the game. We should take another quick break and come back and go through uh, some things, some strategies that you have right. for us information. Perfect. So let's do that. We'll be right back after these messages. Hi, we're here with Temple Grandin. And we're going to be asking her some of your questions that you guys have written in to us. First of all, Temple, I want to thank you for being with us here today. No, it's good and to be answer. here. This is a question that I want to know. When you went to the Emmys and you went to all these different events and you were there in your wonderful shirt, was there anybody who tried to talk you into wearing something else? Or did they just understand that you needed to be who you were? Well, I think being eccentric is just fine. I dressed eccentric at the um, Emmys. Mm -hmm. Eccentric's fine. Being a filthy slob is not fine. Let's look at the latest Mars rover. You got the Mohawk guy that's ahead of the expedition. You got the Elvis guy that figured out how to land on the moon and he wears Elvis outfits. I think that's just fine. But you can't be a rude, filthy, dirty slob. 
That's the thing where draw the line. Eccentrics, fine. I remember a guy who was on the spectrum and he taught astronomy in a local college. And he had beautiful astronomy t-shirts and he had long hair with a ponytail this long. And I said to him, don't let anybody cut your ponytail off. You know, wear it with pride, but it must be washed and it must be clean there you and go. neat. Love it. Did they try to talk you into wearing a dress, or they they? Knew oh no, would... nobody knew I would wear a dress. <laughs> I, I got too much of a farmer tan and would just look just terrible. I no, you're not going to get me in an evening gown. I did buy some new black pants. I'm going to wear okay. it tonight. Well, I thought you looked great. Uh, well, I want to let you know about the shirt award of the Emmys. Yeah. That was a Ralph Lauren oh, shirt. Okay, there you go. fashion snubs. <laughs> and that was a gift from my sister for Christmas. Welcome back to Autism Live. I want to uh, announce to everybody that you just saw Temple Grand in there, and we're about to do, we're getting ready to do another parent question and answer from Temple, Temple Grandin segment. So if you have questions for Temple Grandin, we want to ask you to start sending them to us as soon as possible. And we'll let you know when that segment is coming up. But please send your questions now. We need more questions to ask Temple. Uh, and she loves to answer your questions. So send those over to us. But right now in the studio, we have the fabulous and beautiful Ashley Colas. She's okay. here with us with our good stuff with Ashley. And today we're talking about cyber safety. Yes. A little bit overwhelming <laughs> to talk about, yeah. um, but important. We can't stick our it head in the important. sand. Our kids are on the computer. They find it very reinforcing in most cases, and we want to make sure that they're as safe as possible. Right. So you mentioned a couple of different things that letting them know that we don't share personal information, but you've got some great tips for us. And you talked about safe browsers. Right. So safe browsers are a thing that we can use. Mm -hmm. You can either download a browser from the internet. So you yourself have to make sure that you do your due diligence and look for safe browsers and read reviews. And you'll find a lot in like tech blogs or okay. um, websites. They'll talk about that type of stuff. You can even write in yourself to okay. someone who has a tech blog and ask them. I'm What's a parent a looking for this. Okay. And that's a good you know, a good resource that you trust, you should try to so do that. I just go into Google and I type in safe browser and it's going to bring things up. Yeah. For, I would put for kids or safe browser mm -hmm. for kids. I, Cause I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm good with technology in that I do what I need to do and that's it. And I don't know anything more than that. And I was trying to, to look up something. Jen was telling me about this accelerated reader program at school and that I could look up books online. Just, I'm hopeless. And uh, I started to look it up on uh, some Thing and he said, oh, you should really use Mozilla Firefox. Right. And, and I went, what? What? <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And he said, it's much better if you use Mozilla Firefox for that one. Uh, oh, he, oh, he said Mozilla is something different. He said like Mo Monzilla or whatever it was. He mispronounced it, but he knew how to get there. Right. It was frightening to me. Yeah, kids know a lot of stuff. That's yeah. why I was saying before, we have to know just as much, if not more. We really have to because... Gosh, because I'm the in people trouble. who are targeting our children know more yes. than we know. Okay. So you have to keep up to date. And teachers, schools are doing a good job of educating teachers and putting mm -hmm. filters on their computers. Okay. Um, so the safe browser is something that's important. Also okay. getting safe browsers that you can download for your iPads and your devices. Okay. And then also your browser right now, whatever you're using, has custom settings. Yes. So looking into that and seeing what the options are for customizing parental controls. Yes. That I have done. You can do that on done. your TV. Oh, I haven't done that on the you TV. You can do it on your TV as well. You can block certain channels or certain content. Okay. And shows are rated, so you can block anything, you know, that's over a certain rating. Okay. That you don't want your child watching. And then if they, for you to watch, that you put in a code usually, and it'll okay. unlock those channels. So it's pretty okay. user-friendly. All right. So using parental, parental controls and then okay. finding safe browsers that you you're comfortable with your kid using. Okay. Also, within your device, if you're using an iPad or an iPhone, we have um, we can turn restrictions on and off. So whether apps can access our information, yeah. like our GPS location, or okay. access your contacts, or access your Facebook, or other things on your device. But you can turn those on and off. And okay. so I have all of mine turned off. Okay. And when I do something in the app that needs to request my information, like I use Yelp a lot. Right. So it will just pop up with a request, like it needs my restrictions changed okay. or needs act, uh, permission. I know the in-app 
purchase one is a very important one if you're going to let your child play a game. Absolutely. That you have the in-app purchase turned Turn off. off. Right. Yes. And there are, when you're buying apps, a lot of them now have this um, kind of feature that shows you all the safety features they have, whether they have in-app purchases, and there are all these little icons. And this is part of the initiative by the Child Online um, Privacy Protection Act, I okay. believe, COPA. Okay. And so they're really working hard to keep kids safe. And there are a lot of laws and rules now for people designing apps and what, okay. what they, information they can get from users when their product is geared towards children. Yes. So they're being blocked from accessing certain information or being able to store information on the device. So it makes it a lot harder for developers, but it makes it a lot safer for us because well, we the products that. that we're buying are already kind of, before they're coming into the market, yeah. having a bunch of safeguards. Well, that's good, but we can't just sit back and rely on that. No, we can't. Because there's always going to be holes. And I swear that, you know, these people have nothing better to do than to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week to figure out ways around that, to take advantage right. of our kids. And they, they're they they're really quick. So the other thing that we can do, be after we've done all these things and the customization and the parental controls and safe browsers, is just educate ourselves and our kids. Yeah. There are amazing websites, and um, the one that I really like is called netsmarts.org. Okay. And I sent those, those links to Emily, so maybe she okay. can put them up for us. That one is has section a section for parents, a okay. section for educators, a section for law enforcement, and a section for kids. Wow. So we can go in and we can search by subject. Um, and and that she's Emily's got it up on our screen yeah. right now, so people can see. Uh, it's a great definitely website to go check to. check in on that website and okay. just kind of click around and see what they have. They have a workshop, so you can educate yourself, um, and you can search by topic, and you can read okay. articles. It's it's a really good website, and it's pretty well organized. Okay. Um, and then also. There are safety games. So someone thought it was a good idea to teach our kids through a game about what's safe. And I saw one um, game that is geared towards what information is safe to give another person in okay. a chat room. Uh -huh. And so it's kind of like you have to ID whether or not it's okay or not okay. I like that. And it's like timed and you get points and... It's I kind like of that cool. A, lot. a cool way of learning. So PBS Kids has uh -huh. really fun games. Okay. For teens, I believe that is... Um, and she's got the website there up on the yeah. screen for NS them. dot org has ones for teens because okay. teens are encountering a whole different slew of issues, including cyberbullying. Yes. So, you know, the, the website I mentioned first, NetSmarts, has information about cyberbullying. Okay. Um, and that's where we have to be talking to our kids about what's going on and what people are saying to them and have an open relationship of being honest. Yeah. Um, because that's something that's that's quite serious and has grown in um, the media. We're talking about it a lot more. Yeah. But just being, knowing what your kids are doing and looking, if they have a Facebook account, making sure yeah. that they're not, there aren't inappropriate things going on. Yeah. Really, uh, I think taking the time, being aware. Mm -hmm. I know parents who spend a lot of time going through their child's phone, looking at what the texts are, because I'm told you find out a wealth of information based on what. Jan yes. doesn't have a phone yet, but that's what he's asked for for and this next that's a personal birthday. choice as a parent. Some yeah. parents are completely against it, and they yeah. want to rely solely on trust. Yeah. I will be a very snoopy, <laughs> like, I will snoop in all my kids' stuff, probably. And yeah. my mom did sometimes. She checked in on me, yeah. and there were times when she checked and on me and I was lucky that she did because yeah. you know she was able to catch me doing something and say listen you shouldn't do this right. and help me make better decisions so yeah. in my experience it did help and I appreciate that she did it yeah but it's a personal choice and I don't want to advocate for parents going through their kids their kids private yeah. I, 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 but I, I, leave room, you. I leave room for every possibility too but as one parent said to me because somebody a parent said at a party to that parent you know I can't believe you're snooping for your child and you don't trust your child and I believe in trust and the parent said, oh, I trust my child. It's just the rest of the world I don't trust, right. and that's what I'm checking on. And, and I thought, know, oh, I'm going to use that someday. <laughs> I want to write that down. Absolutely. Because uh, that's know, the truth. 
uh, you know, and I trust my child within the circumstances that he understands, but there's a whole lot of circumstances that he doesn't have the world experience to understand. Right. And your son is, is really smart and he's got a lot of skills that are going to help him socially and with the cognitive processes he needs to understand that some people's intentions are not good. Yeah. Um, but other kids <clears throat> that might be the same age as him, they might be lacking in some of those skill areas. Like we said, intentionality. They might not understand deception yeah. and, and intentionality and some of those things that we teach in our curriculum yeah. here and how they apply to you know these situations that they're involved yeah. in actively on a daily basis usually. Yeah, and it's not just kids on the spectrum, by the way. I mean, I know there's a video that's been making its rounds on the internet in the last couple of days. Uh, there's a new craze amongst teenagers where they inhale a certain piece of birth control. I don't mm. know if you've seen this. No, I haven't. They snort it through their nose and then take it out of their mouth, and it's this great party trick, apparently. And the video that's going around, it shows a young girl, probably 16 years old, and she says, okay, I'm going to show you how to do this, and I probably shouldn't be. I should shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And it's that sort of 16-year-old mentality of, I'm impervious, nothing bad can happen to me. And I'm sitting there watching this horrified thinking, you know, somebody's going to have an allergic reaction to this, or somebody's going to get a cough, Absolutely. somebody's going to die from this, somebody's going to get, it's going to end up in a lung, um, but it's a cute little party trick. And she says twice, she says, looks at the camera and says, well, I probably shouldn't be doing this, then you but I'm going to, right? right. And, and you go, bless your heart, because we've all been 16 and done things that we shouldn't have done. Absolutely. But, you know, as There's a parent, new things. They're trying stuff that oh, is. We were funny. not. I wasn't doing that when I was 16. That wasn't that No, long. I <laughs> never snorted birth control. I can say that unequivocally. Right. And that never even occurred to me. So that being said, YouTube has good filters. And, yes. like, for my niece, she has this special app called, like, iTube or something. Okay. And that is a safe kids YouTube kind of browser thing. Okay. So she's only allowed to search oh. videos that go through these filters. All right. We need to know more about that, but we're out of time. I thank you so much thank for being for here and me. talking about this amazing topic that we could talk about forever and for being somebody who goes around the world to help our kids. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. But uh, we're we're at the end of the show. I want to remind you that tomorrow we have Dr. Adele Nadowski, who's going to be talking about making real progress with safety. And also Dr. Jonathan Tarbox is going to be here sharing some research. So you won't want to miss that. Uh, we'll be back then. Until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.